Okay. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Um, so we introduced Linux Kit at uh, at DockerCon um, yeah, like a month or month and a half ago, and uh, I'm giving a quick intro, like an introduction of why we built Linux Kit to start with, what it is, and then give a couple of demos, uh, uh, which hopefully. Um, give you an idea what Linux Kit is about. But first of all, let's start about um, why we build it. So the over the last so five years or so, there has been a lot of interest in cloud computing and immutable delivery. So here's a quote by uh, Netflix where they basically say, if I want to deploy a server, I want to know exactly what's in there. If I want to upgrade it, I simply terminate it and I launch a new server. Uh, so that means that basically the server and the OS running on it is immutable. Um, you basically build a server just for a particular task, and if you need to upgrade, you build a new one. Um, the same goes for so system administrator. Here's another quote, which is basically if you had a server running for a very long time, uh, people get access to it, it's pretty scary because you don't really know what's running on it anymore. So, but if you can build your system via your CI uh, and it never, it can't change from the time you create it, then basically most of the sort of sysadmin problems disappear. So we initially started looking at uh, building uh, our own Linux systems because we were uh, working on initially the Docker for Mac and then Docker for Windows. Uh, and what we wanted there is basically a, a desktop application, which you know some of you may use. Uh, but essentially, if you restart your your Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, the idea is that if it boots back up, it comes back up in a in a known good state. So we didn't want anything in the Linux subsystem to be changing uh, because it makes it really hard to um, to debug. So we basically needed some form of immutable delivery um, for reliability. Um, and then we extended uh, the, uh, the desktop editions to the cloud. So there's an AWS and an Azure edition where you know the same principle applies. Uh, when we looked around, we couldn't really find any sort of existing, good existing solutions which gave us a really small embedded Linux which had these properties of uh, immutability. So we started building our own initially uh, around um, Alpine Linux, and we basically have been iterating it since about uh, 2015. And so we came up with a design which um, we think is useful for other people, so we open sourced it at DockerCon. We had a lot of interest since then. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> open, so the, the project is actually hosted on GitHub. Um, we, it's, it's on a pretty active development. If you look at the GitHub stats, uh, the spike here uh, in April, that's just the panic just before DockerCon. Uh, but we, we're currently going at about 50 commits a week. Uh, we have um, a total of about 48 contributors, 22 of them are external, so that's pretty healthy. Uh, when we started um, with Linux Kit, we uh, worked with a number of partners who are listed here. Some of them had early access to it, and uh, we are working closely with them to basically make this um, project successful, and of course with the community. So what actually is uh, Linux Kit? So when uh, Solomon announced it on, at DockerCon, so the tagline is, it's a secure, portable, and lean operating system built for containers. So what we actually mean by that. So when we started, we wanted to build something which was like really easy to use, basically batteries included. Uh, it should just work. Uh, but we wanted it customizable because we had different uh, requirements. So we wanted to run it on, say, Docker for Mac, uh, which has a different setup to, say, running it in uh, Docker for Azure. Uh, so it needed to be customizable. It needed to be fast to build because the idea is you want to build your whole, whole system, your entire Linux operating system in your CI pipeline. Uh, and as part of that, you want to have reproducible builds. So if you build one image, if you rebuild it, you want it to be exactly the same as, as the first time around. Um, 
we wanted the system to be fast to boot because um, it's a desktop application to start with. Uh, initially, if you start your Docker for Mac, uh, we want it to be, you know, not wait for like 30 seconds before you can do something. So fast to boot uh, was um, important. As already said, uh, we also wanted it immutable in production just to have maintainability of the system. Um, the Linux kit itself is actually designed to be managed by external tooling. Uh, what we mean by that is the Linux VM in Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows, but also in the cloud ed editions, is actually managed by on, on the desktop by the application itself, or in some of the cloud editions uh, by tooling like uh, InfraKit and other things. So. It's supposed to be a, a system which you just boot and then manage from the outside. And of course, we wanted it to be container native, cloud native, because that's where everyone is moving to. Uh, but of, of course, it also needed to be suitable to run in VMs because that ought to be run on desktops and bare metal as well, because there are some use cases for that. Um, one you know, very important aspect to us as well is, is security. So when we design the system, we kind of want to have it with good secure defaults. So the way we build the system is we build it around base containers, um, which we emphasize to be minimal and secure. So in order to build a Linux VM for something like Docker for Mac or for uh, Docker for Azure or AWS, you only really need to run a few containers to provide the services and to run Docker. Um, and we basically just want to have the minimum to bootstrap a distributed system, like a cluster of VMs in the cloud for it. So it's really just a kit, but you can replace any of these components for it. The way we achieve this is, so as, as part of the uh, DockerCon announcement, we also uh, created a new project called Mobi, which is a sort of a larger project. Uh, but one important new aspect to it, which we introduced, um, is the uh, Mobi tool. And the Mobi tool is something we use to build systems. And we initially developed it in the context of Linux Kit. But it's just like the first use case. So uh, we use the Mobi tool to assemble Linux systems. But the idea is that in the future, we will extend it to build a system to assemble other components. It's really designed to put together distributed uh, systems. And almost everything the Mobi tool handles is uh, built from containers. So that, that's uh, an important aspect of it. Um, the Input to the Mobi tool uh, is a YAML file. And the idea is that the YAML file would define the whole system. And what we mean by that, it is defines the kernel, it defines the boot scripts, configuration containers, service containers, uh, the contents of the, the file system. Uh, we don't really want to have many or any external dependencies when building it, because one thing should define what we are building. Uh, the YAML file currently also defines the output format. So what should the output be? Uh, uh, in the case of Linux kit, these are like bootable ISOs or AMIs you can uh, uh, boot on Azure, uh, on AWS, et cetera. Uh, though we are currently um, contemplating on changing and uh, providing the output format in, a, in another stage because it's, it's a little bit different. Um, to give you maybe a better idea, I, I thought it's, it's a good point to uh, start with a small demo. Um, people who may have seen the uh, DockerCon keynote may have seen uh, an earlier version of this. Um, so to start off with, we uh, look at a small uh, YAML file, and I'm using a similar file which we used in the DockerCon demo, which is uh, we are building a uh, Linux system which runs Redis. And as I said, we use this as a uh, The file is actually quite small. So in the YAML file, we have a number of sections. So we have the kernel section here, 
and there we say we want to have a 4.9 kernel, which is the current long-term support Linux kernel. The X says we just want to have like the latest version of it, which we supply. The command line here is basically the kernel command line we pass in. That's pretty much the same for like almost all of the YAML files we have. In the next section, we specify the uh, part of the root file system and in particular, uh, what a Linux system does when it boots up, it executes the first process that executes in user space is called init. And we have a particular version of that. And we also add to the uh, system uh, run C and container D. Um, those are the ones we then use to run containers. So uh, in Linux kit, we are running containers, which are basically uh, bare containers, so they're not managed by Docker, but they are managed by uh, run C and container D directly. Then the next two sections are actually the more interesting ones. So uh, these are the ones where you specify which containers to run. There's a on-boot section, which are basically one-shot containers, which you run um, during the boot process, and you can have multiple of those, and they're executed in sequence. So in this case, I'm specifying a DHCP uh, container uh, because we would like our um, Linux to get an IP address. Uh, we specify a particular image which we want to use for it and the command going to execute when that, contain the, that DHCP container is uh, started. You can have multiple of these on-boot uh, services. For example, we have some which will uh, format or mount a disk to provide persistent storage, um, but they are executed in sequence. In the next section, here's where you specify services. You can view them as, as daemons in a traditional Linux system. Um, and here is where I basically specify uh, my Redis image. And if you look at the image line here, this is actually the standard Redis uh, image you can download from um, from Docker Hub, and it's uh, based on on Alpine. Uh, unlike the uh, DHCP package, we uh, have to specify for this particular service which capabilities. Um, uh, first of all, we need to specify that we would like to run this container in the uh, host networking namespace, which means that. Uh, we can connect to it from the outside. Um, we also need to specify some capabilities this container ha has to have. Uh, in particular, it needs to be able to bind to a network uh, so that it can listen on a port. So you specify the capabilities precisely of what this container needs and nothing more. Finally, um, in the output section, we specify that we would like to generate a kernel and an initial RAM disk, which is something you can boot on a uh, virtual machine. Um, if you look at the contents in my current directory, it only has this one YAML file. Uh, we have a utility, as I mentioned, which is called this is a Mobi tool, which has a build uh, option, and it takes the YAML file as an argument. If I execute this, it will now process. It will pull these images from Docker Hub if they are not already present on the local system. Um, in this case, they are already present on the local system. And it will, will then process the init containers, the three images I specified. Uh, it will then go on to the on-boot containers, and it will create an OCI configuration, which is something container D and run C understand uh, from this image, and the, um, and the Redis image. If we now look at the Output here, we see we generated three files. Uh, one of them is the kernel, uh, which is about seven megabytes in size. Then the initial RAM disk, which contains the containers as well as the init processes. Um, that is uh, only 35 me uh, megabyte in size. And the command line, uh, which we also specified in the YAML file. So we just built uh, from a very simple description, a system which we can actually boot. We have another utility called Linux Kit. And what Linux Kit is, allows you to do 
is it allows you to take the output from um, from the Mobi tool and run it. In this case, I'm going to run it on my local Mac, which uh, utilizes uh, HyperKit, uh, which is something we open sourced um, last year and which is used in Docker for Mac and also VPN kit for networking. But we can just uh, do a Linux kit run. And what you now see here is, is a normal boot process for of a Linux system. And we have just booted in a couple of seconds. So as you may recall, one of the requirements was to be able to boot fast. Um, so we just booted in a couple of seconds a system. Um, if you have a look around in, in the system itself, um, we can have a look at the processes we are running. We see our init process, which is the initial process which is uh, executed when the system transitions from the kernel to user space. Then container D, uh, and container D starts a process called Redis server. And then we have a shell, and that's pretty much it. Um, we can have a look at the containers which are running uh, using the uh, container D command line, which is called Kutter. And we see we have one container running. The container is called Redis. Um, the DHCP container we specify is a one-shot container, so it has only run once during boot, and it's done and exited, but uh, we can check that we actually have an IP address, and we see we received an IP address from the network, so the DHCP container actually runs. And finally, we can uh, check that we actually have a uh, Redis system running. So Redis uh, listens on uh, port 6379. So I can tell that to it. If I ping it, it will require this pong. I can interact it. I can point a Redis client at it. And we basically um, have built a, uh, a Linux system which just runs Redis. Uh, let's exit this and go back to our presentation. Um, so that, that's a sort of a quick run through how you use like the Mobi tool to um, take a YAML file, assemble the system, and then boot it, a minimal system, and then boot it. Um, so it's, it's a, it satisfies the constraints we had or requirements we had of being able to boot it fast. So you can imagine uh, some of this being just boot, uh, built as part of your CI pipeline for your custom purposes, and it boots pretty fast. Um, so um, as I uh, mentioned earlier, so security is something uh, which we take quite serious. In particular, if we want to deploy services in the cloud that will be potentially exposed by, uh, to the wider internet, exposed to attacks, etc. Uh, so one important aspect of security is to really only include what you need. So as is seen from the Redis example, we really just included Redis and uh, container D and run C to run it, and that is it, and the DHCP kind, of course. So there's no extra services running, nothing else. So the attack surface is relatively small. Uh, one of the other thing is that we are actually tracking uh, the Linux kernel stable releases. So uh, utilizing modern kernels uh, allows us to take advantage of security fixes. So currently the Linux community is releasing a new stable uh, kernel with bug and security fixes about once a week, and we track that. We also take care that our kernel configuration is secure and follows the kernel self-protection project uh, guidelines. And that means that we don't enable certain kernel configuration options, uh, which may uh, make the kernel more susceptible to some attacks. Uh, we enable certain security features, etc. Another important aspect is that we actually um, mark the uh, root file system of our system as read-only. Uh, that is also part of the story around the immutable infrastructure, uh, because if your root file system is read-only, you can't change it while the server is running. But it also means that an attacker can't uh, 
place any files on it, which then may get picked up or allow you to exploit things. Finally, we run all our services, like the Redis uh, uh, servers, inside a container. And as you saw from the YAML file, you can specify which capabilities each container should have. So we try to make it sure that each container has the minimal privileges uh, it requires to run and nothing more. So we basically add another line of defense. So if someone is able to compromise something like Redis, they are still contained within container. And finally, we are using uh, Linux Kit actually to test and then ship an awful uh, new security features. And uh, I have a list of that later on in the presentation. But let's have a look at um, some of these features uh, in practice. So I'm uh, going back to my, um, so I'm still locked into my Linux Kit VM here. Um, first of all, um, I'm showing you we are running the latest Linux uh, stable kernel, uh, the 4.9.29, uh, which was released on Sunday. Um, actually, if I'd given this presentation last week, it would have been better because 4.9.28, which got released uh, last week, had an important uh, fix for um, a security hole, which was marked as a score 10 on the CVE mark, which basically made your system susceptible to um, a denial of service attacks. So by using the very latest kernels, uh, we, we kind of minimize that risk. Um, I, I mentioned that we have a read-only file system, so I could try, for example, creating a file in bin. Let's say uh, I have a, a uh, I'm an attacker, I have a compromised bash, which I want to install, I can touch, I, can't touch it because the file system is read-only. I can't do any damage because um, everything is read-only. So the uh, the system uh, just continues as it is. Uh, so the read-only file system gives you some you know, protection for attackers, but also uh, prevents you from causing damage to your system. Um, We've already looked at the processes which we are running, so we only have the Redis server uh, running. But if we look at the, um, actually the services, the network services we are running, so netstat-l shows you which services are listening on network socket. And we only have the Redis container listening on localhost 6379 and also on IPv6. And we have another service listening on port 13337. And that's actually container D, which exports uh, Prometheus stats, uh, which we can disable. So um, our Linux system, which we built from the ground up, is really only listening on the Redis port and nothing else. So an attacker would only could only attack Redis. Um, so finally, if we, uh, I, I've already showed that uh, we are only running one container. Uh, and if you look inside this container, so I can uh, exec into the container. Um, so I'm, I'm going to execute a shell inside the Redis container. So I'm now inside the container. If I do PS, I only see the processes which are run in, in, inside the container. So that's the Redis server, my shell, and PS. So I can't see any processes from the host. I can't see any other containers running. And that's because we started the Redis container within its own namespace, uh, with a, within its own file system. So it can only see, uh, so even if it gets compromised, an attacker would still need to be able to break out this container to compromise other services. So we are providing a number of secu uh, a number of layers of security um, for for our systems for, by default. Right. Um, one of the things um, which we are providing with Linux Kit is a number of packages. So there are a number of base packages. These are container images which you can specify in the YAML file. Um, 
And packages are really just container images which are stored on Hub, or you can store it on a private registry if you wish so. Um, and this allows us to use um, technologies like uh, Docker Content Trust, i.e. Notary, uh, to sign our packages so that when you build um, a, a image from scratch, uh, you can verify and be sure that the system image you're building is built from the uh, components you expect it to be built from. Uh, it also means that we can utilize uh, features like the uh, security scanning on Hub, excuse me, which will scan the images for known uh, security vulnerabilities and then notify you. So again, that's another layer of uh, protection um, around it. So if we uh, find out that one of our patches has a known security vulnerability, we can upgrade it and we know which uh, uh, which images to upgrade, etc. If you look at the source code, the, uh, all the base packages in Linux Kit are under the package subdirectory, and by default, the um, packages are all stored uh, on Docker Hub under the Linux Kit org. But as I said, you can overwrite that uh, to use your own private res registry or your uh, your your own uh, organization on Hub. Uh, finally, because the images are just container images for development, and that's certainly what I do quite often, is I just build the Im uh, images locally on my Docker for Mac or Docker for Windows and have it on my local Docker installation, and I don't push them to Hub, but I just pull them uh, using the Mobi tool to build uh, Linux images, so I don't have to go through the pushing to Hub uh, stage. Um, to look at what packages actually look like more concretely, there are different ways of building packages. So sometimes you can just reuse a, a Linux kit package straight from Hub. And we've seen this with uh, the Redis example, or you can use the Nginx example, uh, Nginx or similar systems which if you uh, use Docker run and uh, you have a container image, you can just do docker run and start the service. You can pretty much use them straight and use them as a Linux kit uh, package and include them into your Linux image. The second way of building is, is um, using, sometimes you have hub images which are, uh, which are complete, but you need to write a, a small wrapper around them. Um, so uh, if you look at the Linux Kit repository, there's an example for etcd, for example, where we take the standard etcd image, but we have a shell script wrapper around it, which uh, provides the command line options for etcd for a particular environment. So that's a very, again, a very straightforward and easy way to build and customize your, your image. Um, most of the package inside the Linux Kit uh, repository um, are built in in two other ways. So, because they are specialized of system container type images. So, the first way is to build a custom base image, and we mostly use Alpine Linux for it because it is um, it provides very small uh, base images, and um, we have a lot of experience with that. Um, and yeah, it has really small uh, base images. Uh, the final way is to um, build custom, completely custom packages, and there are some examples in the Linux Kit repository which basically compile a single binary on the fly and then put it into a scratch, Im, uh, scr uh, from scratch container image, and they just contain one binary. Um, those are, you know, of course, very custom packages, and, but we would expect most users of Linux Kit to use one of the first three um, examples to build their packages. Um, for the Linux Kit base images or base packages, um, we actually build them using known, a known Alpine base image. So we have uh, an Alpine image which has all the packages we need installed, and that 
image is actually pushed to a hub. So we can pull it, we can build images without requiring any network access. So we get reproducible builds this way um, because we build from, we know all the versions of all the packages in that system. We need to update it, we push a new image to hub, a new base image to hub. We also make very extensive use of multi-stage builds, which is a new feature in Docker 1704. And that allows us to keep the packages really small. Um, and in the YAML files, you may have seen that they all have a, a hash value at the end. And that's actually the content hash of the files which were used to build the, the package. Um, and then again, it allows us to identify exactly what source code a package was built from. Uh, let's have a look at, at an example because uh, it hopefully makes it a little bit clearer. So I'm here in my uh, Linux kit uh, repository and I'm in the uh, package for the DHCP uh, daemon which we used earlier. If we have a look at the uh, directory, we see we have a Docker file, we have a make file, we have the DHCP configuration file, and uh, there are some files under user, which are the some shell scripts which DHCP uses when a new address is is executed uh, is is acquired. So if we have a look at the um, at the Docker file itself, um, you see. So this is a, a, a multi-stage build, as you can spot from the two from lines. In the first stage here, we build from an Alpine base image, which is part of Linux kit, which has specific versions of all the packages we need, in particular, uh, in this case, the DHCP package. Uh, we then create a directory where we want to install uh, the image, the, the, the contents of the packets. And then we use the Alpine package manager to install in that directory um, a standard base layout, which is the standard root file system, uh, busybox, because we need a shell, the DHCP daemon, of course, and Muzu, which is the C library used by, uh, by these components. What we end up after this stage is basically a container image, which is based on our Alpine base image, but it has a directory called out, which has a root file system, uh, which has enough installed to run a DHCP daemon inside it, okay? And then we remove some temporary files because we want to make our, um, our, image, our uh, DHCP package small. So in the second stage, we say from scratch, we start with an empty container image, and then we copy from the previous stage the out directory to our root file system. Then we add the DHCP daemon configuration and the uh, DHCP scripts to our root file system as well. We specify a command, which is when the container starts, we want it to execute the DHCP daemon in the background and using this uh, configuration. So this builds us a minimal uh, package which runs a DHCP daemon. We recently added as recent as I think Monday, um, the ability, so if you remember going back to the uh, YAML file I showed for the Redis container, we had to specify things like which capabilities it should have in order to operate. Um, I didn't have to specify that for the DHCP um, container. And the reason for that is that we can actually specify in a label the configuration for this container. So um, you need to have some bind mounts so that the etcd, uh, et cetera, is mounted. Uh, we execute in the network and host network namespace. 
And in order to set the IP address, it needs the capabilities net admin. In order to bind to an interface, it needs the uh, net bind capabilities. And in order to receive raw Ethernet frames, which is how DHCP works, it needs the net raw capabilities. So this Docker file defines the content of the package. And if you look at the make file for this, it is pretty straightforward. Um, it basically contains a Docker build command. Um, we use the squash option here to uh, squash the layers we are creating in the second stage into a single, single layer to make it even smaller. And you notice here that we specify network none. And that means that while we are building the container, the container has no access to the network. We really build the image just from other images. So given that we have all the hash values for all the packages, we are, the, uh, the Docker images we are using, it's a reproducible build. And what we then do is we uh, push the image to a hub. Actually, we check beforehand whether this image is already on hub and then don't push it. For the hash value, we use the git tree hash. What that does is it basically gives you the content hash of all the files in the directory. So we now have the content hash of um, all the files. Therefore, we know what the file, what the package was built from. Um, so these are basically the Docker file, the make file, the DHCP configuration, etc. So if we type make, it will build this image. Um, we see that it's building it from scratch. It's copying the information from out. And uh, in this case, it is not pushing it to hub because it pulls it from hub and it's already there. If you have a look at the image itself, the package itself, um, we have a look here. And you see that the whole image which contains the DHCP kind is just 1.7 megabytes in size. So it's, it's, it's very small. Um, if you go one level up in the directory structure, you see that there are a number of other packages which are, most of them are built in a similar type of way. Uh, and that allows us to build very small packages from scratch in a reproducible way. Right. Oh, that was a demo. <laughs> um, so we, in the example it's, uh, I used earlier, I, I just used Linux Kit Run on my local Mac. So um, we have support for other platforms. So of course we are supporting OS X and HyperKit, which is uh, what I demonstrated, but you can also use Linux Kit uh, in conjunction with QMU and KVM. Uh, so that works also on the Mac, but primarily on Linux. Uh, we have support for VMware, uh, so you can create VMware VMs and start them. Um, and we are working, we have some preliminary support to also uh, run Linux Kit images on Windows. Uh, we are in the process of uh, making the Windows support a first-class citizen, so you can do a Linux Kit run on Windows as well. In terms of cloud, we currently support Google Cloud, uh, so you can build packages or you can build images which you can build, uh, run on Google Cloud, um, and also bare metal. And there, we currently mostly work with Packet.mat because they provide bare metal services in the cloud, with, which have um, uh, uh, Pixie boot capability, so you can boot your server off the images you can build. In progress, um, we are working on support for AWS Azure, IBM Bluemix, and uh, VMware uh, vCenter, so you can deploy your images on a VMware cluster and the uh, sort of standard cloud providers. Um, other area uh, in progress are ARM64 support. Um, we actually two weeks ago uh, managed to build and boot our first uh, ARM kernel and um, 
on on a system on packet on net actually on bare metal and we are in the pro uh, in in the process of integrating that build support into the Linux Git repository. And as already mentioned, we are working on native Windows support so that you can run Linux Git VMs on, on Windows in the same way you can do it on, on OS X. Uh, we also have some uh, folks uh, interested in adding better bare metal support. So there are new standards like Redfish uh, and various uh, vendor specific um, uh, management console support, which would allow you to uh, uh, boot uh, Linux kit uh, images on on uh, cl uh, hardware clusters. So that's some of the ongoing work. Um, in general, since uh, DockerCon, we have been primarily uh, focusing on improving tooling, packaging, documentation, better platform support. Um, we are also working on improving security, and uh, quite an exciting area is better integration into InfraKit. And I, I think in the next slide or two, there is a link to a demo uh, David Chung gave, a uh, combination of InfraKit and, and Linux Kit, which will allow you to deploy clusters built with Linux Kit images on the fly, which is pretty cool. So looking further in the future, um, we view Linux Kit as a place to innovate around immutable and secure infrastructure. So one of the things we are working on is um, incorporating some of the unikernel technologies to implement sy secure system services in type safe languages. So replacing things like DHCP daemon with uh, implementation written in type safe languages. Uh, there's some support or, or some work on getting Kubernetes to work on Linux Kit. There are a number of security projects around WireGuard, which is a new um, secure VPN so, uh, container where VPN solution, um, Linux security modules, key containers. Uh, the HP Okernel project is really exciting because it provides better protection for containers inside the Linux kernel, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of projects where, uh, because it's relatively easy with Linux kits to build your images, it's quite a nice place to uh, to explore these new technologies. And we would we are very happy to provide a, a place to incubate these projects. And then hopefully promote some of them into uh, fully supported um, technologies inside Linux kit. So uh, it's an open source project. Um, please do get involved. Um, the GitHub link is here. We have a community Slack uh, where most of us hang out. Um, there's also actually in parallel with this meeting, there's the first meeting of a special interest group around security. Um, there's a link to uh, the uh, documents of that and that's going to be held every two weeks. Uh, there are other resources on the web, uh, so we publish a weekly status report, so if you want to keep up with the development on Linux Kit, uh, we publish a report every week. Uh, there are two videos I have links to here, which one of them gives a wider security story around Linux Kit, and the other one is the uh, very interesting presentation of, from David Chung uh, with a combination of InfraKit and Linux Kit. And with that, uh, I think we are open to questions. Yeah, so Rolf, I think that you should be able to view the Q&A section. Yeah. Um, but if if you can, then um, you can kind of start from the top there. Oh, there's a Q&A section, great. Yeah, yeah. If, you can, if you can see that, then I also put the question in a Google Doc that I can share with you if, if you're having issues reading actually in the Q&A section. Yeah, Q and A. There's a lot about. Oh my. Oh, uh, so there's a question asking uh, whether service container have default capabilities. Um, so the service containers basically have the default capabilities at, because they're run just as uh, container D containers. So whatever. Uh, 
the default capabilities given by container DR, you have them in a container and then you can specify extra privileges. Okay. There's a question about what type of security mechanism is taken care in Linux kit. Um, so there are a number of measures. Um, it's, it's a quite a broad question. So um, there are things like we are trying to secure the Linux kernel configuration. Uh, according to the recommendation of the uh, Linux hardening project, uh, we have things like uh, read-only uh, file system. We uh, use use privilege um, for things like the containers uh, we run. Um, we are also working on things like uh, DM Verity, which I haven't mentioned yet. <coughs> which allows you to verify that your root file system is the one you expect, etc. So it's Oh, oh, so there are IP tables, there's a follow-up question. Um, so at the moment we don't deploy uh, SE Linux um, and IP tables. Uh, we are looking at the landlock uh, LSM modules because they are more container friendly, which will allow you to uh, specify, um, which will allow you to specify uh, LSM policies in eBPF for containers, which I think we find is a very exciting uh, direction. Uh, someone wants to know about the ETA on uh, Windows support and AWS support. Um, I think the Windows support, if I get time, I'll probably work on it next week. Uh, the uh, AWS support, I saw someone was uh, started working on it. Uh, we actually have most of the support there because we have additions uh, for AWS. We just need to find the time to uh, port it over. I suspect it will be hopefully within a month. Um, the Q&A. Uh, okay. Okay, there's a question on uh, service containers having writable file system. Uh, Yes, so you can specify uh, containers to have read-only file system or writable file system. By default, these are in uh, in RAM disks or so tempfs. Um, but you can uh, we have mechanisms and examples to um, mount a physical disk uh, and then provide and then bind mount uh, specific directories into containers so that, for example. Uh, the Docker, a Docker container uh, has a persistent storage for its images. I think that also asked the, uh, answers the question from, from Takeshi. Uh, so yes, we can mount, we can format and mount disks um, and then you can bind mount them into containers and then the container can use those spaces for persistent storage. So Ralph, there's there if you can um, check out the the Q and A section, the all. Okay. Uh, there's a bunch of questions in there, and also just if if we don't have time to get to all of them, I, I put them all in a doc, so hopefully when Ralph has some time this week, he can um, answer them and, and we'll publish the answers to the remaining questions. Well, so the first question here is about, <clears throat> so uh, if you specify images for init processes, like um, init run C and container D, so those are the only ones which are not run inside a container. So it's the init process uh, which runs outside a container. Uh, and it then starts container D and cutter to start the other the on boot services and the the on boot and the services container inside containers. But uh, run C, container D, and the init process are not running inside a container. Uh, there's a question about Linux Kit which uh, doesn't have native Docker. Um, 
there are examples in the Linux kit uh, repository which show how you can run Docker inside a uh, container inside a Linux kit image. So you can get native Docker support by installing Docker inside a container decontainer, in fact. And uh, then you can run Docker commands against that. And then manage Docker containers on top of that. So there's a question about how to deploy artifacts in product, into production. Um, so there are different ways, and they are depending on the provider. So um, uh, for bare metal, you would typically use something like um, Pixie booting. Uh, you have a Pixie boot server where you make the images available. For Google, for the Gold uh, providers, you would upload the image in the format either as a tarball for Google Cloud or an AMI or VHD uh, for AWS and Azure. And then you upload it to the cloud provider and then create VMs using those images. That's how you would, uh, uh, yeah, you, you upload the images. And then if you just want to create a single VM, you can use the Linux kit utility, or you will be able to use the Linux kit utility once you have support for AWS and Azure. Uh, but in order to deploy clusters, uh, we, you can use things like uh, InfraKit or, or other uh, orchestration platforms for managing clusters. And, and Rolf, as, as you're answering the questions, if you uh, don't mind repeating, repeating the question first. Before yes, sorry. I, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a question here on how do you mount to the inner container Mac versus Linux. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I understand this question correctly, um, but if this is about sharing your host file system with the VM, that is not part of the scope of Linux Kit. So those are um, so if you run a Linux Kit VM on Linux or on the Mac, it doesn't have access by default to to the host file system. Um, we are open sourcing the components um, which make that work on on uh, on Docker for Mac, um, and we're actually in the process of porting them to Linux Kit. Uh, there's a question on how how do you use your own kernel? Um, there's a documentation that that was actually a question which came up quite a few times over the last few weeks. So we added on, in the docs directory in the Linux Git repository, there's a document detailing both how the kernels are built, how you can build your own kernel, how you can build uh, kernel modules, uh, and so on. So if, if those doc documents are not sufficient, then please ping us on Slack or on GitHub, and we um, hopefully will improve them. Uh, there's a question about how you install other software that is not in a container. Uh, uh, you don't, <laughs> so everything should run in a container. Uh, so the example question here was asking for SSH. Um, we would also recommend running SSH in a container. Uh, in particular, we almost certainly soon will switch off the access to the root file system. So the Linux kit run example I gave where you drop into a command prompt will go away. Um, and then the only way to interact with your system is via a container which runs either a console or SSH. And there's an example for that um, in the Linux kit uh, repository as well for running an SSH. Uh, there's a question on how can I load kernel modules? Yes, you can. Um, uh, IP tables is actually compiled, so there is a question about IP tables and contract. Uh, IP tables are actually compiled into the kernel and contract as well, so you don't need to um, uh, you don't need to load those uh, modules. Uh, you can compile kernel modules against the kernel as well. That's documented in the under doc kernel as well. Um, so yes, you can you can load kernel modules. 
there's a question about remounting slash as rewrite. I believe that's currently possible, but as I said, we will remove the access to the root file system and or the login to the root file system, and then you will not be able to do that. Uh, there's another question. Once I build image, uh, an image based on the YAML specification, how do I add additional services if I want to? So you would have to add additional services to the YAML specification and then rebuild. So there is no uh, supported way of adding services once you have an, an image built. So you have to build it from scratch again. There's a question of whether it has to be uh, Alpine Linux or whether you can use a minimal Debian. Uh, of course, you can. So the, the base system is actually not Alpine. So the, well, we use BusyBox um, and the BusyBox init process to start ContainerD, but then all the container images are currently based on Alpine because it gives us very small images, but you can uh, build the same images or your custom images around Debian. Um, but the init process uh, we have is very minimal, and it's not, it's actually not the uh, Alpine, it's, the, it's, it's currently the busy box, but again, it doesn't do much, it would just do the initial init and start ContainerD, and that's it. So there's, um, uh, we, we actually contemplate of replacing that with a custom init process. Uh, there's a question about will Mobi Linux Kit support Kubernetes. Um, we already have an example for uh, in, under the uh, project repository, uh, project directory for building a, uh, a kubelet uh, using Linux Kit. Um, you can certainly uh, build a Kubernetes cluster with it. Um, these uh, so Kubernetes itself is not really a package we, which will be part of Linux Kit itself because Linux Kit is just for building the base Linux uh, uh, image and, and Kubernetes is at a sort of a higher level. Um, and you know, people, but people can use it to build uh, Kubernetes on top of it. There's, I think the next question was on default capabilities. I've already answered that. Uh, there's a question about the slides being online. I, I believe this was recorded and the slides will be available online as well uh, yeah. in a few days. Uh, there's a question about VirtualBox, um, whether we support VirtualBox format. I don't think we currently support it. Uh, we are happy to take contributions. Uh, the reason it's not supported at the moment is that the, uh, so the QMU uh, support was supported uh, was uh, was uh, was done by by an external contributor, uh, the VMware one as well, and we just hadn't had time to build it. If someone wants to build VirtualBox, that would be great. We would be very happy to accept it. You can build, uh, you can run the images with VirtualBox, so you can create an ISO image and boot it, uh, but it's not as part of the Linux Kit run command line. Uh, I would say maybe one more question, and then, um, like I said, I, I, I took notes on, on the remaining questions, and then um, we'll, we'll send out the slides and the video recording um, in a blog post shortly. There's a question on um, whether beginners should use Linux Kit and whether Linux Kit is for beginners. Um, I think it will be quite fun to, I mean, uh, it depends on your, your interest, um, but if you ever felt the need or the, the urge to play with Linux systems, building from scratch on your own, which uh, I had to do for a very long time, then uh, please feel free to Try it out, and if the documentation isn't sufficient, um, we are more than happy to to help with that and um, um, get you started. <laughs>